Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar, Wednesdays, noontime Eastern, in which we um, bring you 20 minutes of hot news from Latin America and the Caribbean. So this week, we are really pleased to have Latin American independent journalist Alina Duarte join us live from Mexico City. Uh, Alina is, uh, is Mexicana, and so we're so pleased to um, have mm -hmm. you speaking with us. Some of you may um, recognize her name and her work um, from Telesur uh, here in Washington, D.C., and she has recently returned home to Mexico and is um, able to give us 20 minutes of hot news from Mexico City um, this afternoon. So, Alina, you and I have talked, oh, the past year or so, and specifically the last month, about uh, Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, Obrador, excuse me, AMLO, as most of us refer to him, <laughs> about um, his first year in office. He was inaugurated in December of 2018. So December of 2019, um, completed his first year. And we've had a number of conversations about expectations, performance, foreign, his foreign policy, economic policy, et cetera. And one of the things that came out of that, um, our conversations was um, comments on the party that widely elected him to office, the Morena party. And we've discussed Morena as um, an electoral platform versus a political movement throughout Mexico. And so maybe that's a good place for us to start with a looking back over the first year and what um, what Morena looks like and what other social act movements look like in Mexico. Uh, yeah, very well. Hey, once again, thanks for having me. This is not the first time. Last time we were talking from Chile. Yeah, so exactly. now in Mexico City. Uh, yeah, well, basically uh, I want to start because it's really hard to explain what's going on here in, in Mexico because a lot of things are going on. Um, it's a democratically elected government uh, that now has 70% of approval. I mean, it's, it's something really uh, unbelievable that after a year of, of, of his administration, he has 70% of uh, approval between the Mexicans uh, but also it's like uh, confusing uh, at this point because as you said, Morena, now we are doubting if this is, if it is still a movement. Uh, we need to remember that Andres Manuel López Obrador, he's not part of these uh, economical and political elites in Mexico. He comes uh, from the social movements. Uh, those social movements could put him in the presidency basically. And during this last year, it has been really uh, confusing for a lot of people, even when he has a lot of support, to see that the same people that he used to call the mafia in power now is part of his government. There are a lot of members of the, the Mexican oligarchy. Actually, if you go now to Twitter last night, he was having dinner with the most powerful people here in Mexico City and in, it, actually in the world. People from Amazon, Walmart uh, had dinner last night in the presidential palace here in Mexico City. So we are still thinking that uh, he's trying to have a pleasing conversation with these people who during the last 12 years made him his life like impossible they tried to uh, they opposed uh, several times uh, for him to be the president of this country and after 14 years of being in the streets with the social movements but also um uh, as a, not, not only as a presidential candidate, remember he was the mayor of Mexico City and he did uh, an amazing work uh, talking about uh, social programs, about education, about healthcare. Now he's trying to do the same uh, in a national scale, but now it's, it's confusing because as I said, part of the oligarchy that he was uh, calling all the time the mafia in power now is part of his government. And even when he has addressed a lot of uh, issues for the working class, like increasing the minimum wage uh, during the last two months, I mean, he has uh, implemented several, several uh, social programs. People are still thinking that 
we cannot see the real progress. Uh, and that's basically because of his alliances. In order to win the presidency in 2018, in July, he had to do these alliances. And now it's pretty complicated even for him to keep continue with his agenda. Um, it's not a socialist, a communist, or a, a revolutionary leftist agenda. It's a welfare state <laughs> one. It's more. It's pretty similar to the uh, agenda of uh, Bernie Sanders. I know that for people in the U.S., Bernie Sanders sounds really radical, uh, but. In, in our tradition of the leftist tradition, he's not that. And they're not communists, they're not uh, anti-capitalists. They are trying just to navigate the situation. But at the same time, uh, now, at the same time now, people are still going back to the streets uh, protesting for several issues. And it's the first time, I think, during the last year that now we are seeing once again people, people in the streets. And so our... There's a couple things I wonder if you can comment on. Um, in your first statement mentioning that um, the president had dinner last night with uh, the mafia, quote unquote, you mentioned Amazon. And of course, in this morning's news is a uh, mention of this um, new North American trade deal um, with, I believe it was Amazon, some of the companies mentioned in the news this morning, Chevron, Amazon, Sempra, um, and this was organized through the America Society Council on the Americas. And so there they were having dinner with the president last night. So, exactly. And now people, exactly. so people obviously are not happy with that. Are they protesting principally in Mexico City or, are you, or, or is this a movement throughout the country? Well, there, there are several issues. First of all, uh, as I told you, it's pretty confusing for people to see now these kind of uh, alliances in the government when he used to call them the mafia in power. And now they are going uh, back and forth from the presidential palace. But also, um, I think that one of the things that really like uh, pissed uh, people in Mexico is uh, his policy toward, uh, towards the uh, the projects, for example, the Maya train, that it's the same uh, extractivist, the same um, uh, projects that he used to criticize with another government. These projects, this mega project in uh, the peninsula um, of Yucatan, uh, it has a lot of opposition uh, from indigenous people. And now instead of Andres Manuel listening to these movements, he is saying that it's about progress. The same rhetoric that we heard during the last uh, governments, neoliberal governments, now he is still repeating the idea of progress in the indigenous communities. Uh, also, and that's really important to see, uh, I'm really impressed how the feminist movement that we in Latin America, uh, I think we, we, start, we started seeing it in, in Argentina, when it comes uh, to about abortion. Now in Mexico City, during the last two or three years, we have seen the increase of this movement that now I think it's it's a rare, it's a weird combination of how is it going. But I think that now we are aware, the Mexicans, of the levels of violence that the media tried just to to black out during the last decade after the government of Felipe Calderón started a uh, war uh, against the drugs, that it was just a civil war that uh, let us around 200,000 people disappeared, 200,000 uh, 200, people killed in Mexico. I mean, it was a massacre during the last uh, um, 12 years. See, and that now, is another that those of us in North America never hear or rarely hear, 200,000. Thousand, and that yeah, happened under a U.S. It's, it's supported not a government. Exactly, and that's not a coincidence that the, that the media tried to black out all of this information because the U.S. government precisely was one of the supporters of this strategy that we saw uh, during the 90s in Colombia. And the effect is that the people are getting murdered in our countries and the drugs are still flowing to the U.S. So it's not a, it's not a coincidence that the mass media, the corporate media are trying to do this blocking. 
decade, this blackout. So that's why now um, there are a lot of corporate media that are, it's obviously that it's obvious that they are against and most administration that now are showing this violence. So there is this perception of a lot of people who are confused uh, because they didn't see a lot of this violence during the last 12, 14 years. And now they think that it's uh, something uh, it, that the reason is Amos administration and not a structural violence during the last uh, almost two decades in Mexico. So people are, are getting aware of this uh, violence and also the feminist movement is increasing every single day and now the, that they are in the streets because feminist sites were something really common. I mean, I've been journalist for the last nine years of my life and I've been covering a lot of like really horrible episodes of violence in this country. And I remember covering feminist sites and sometimes we were just one, two journalists covering the story. And now of course that the media has interest in covering now these kind of issues. But I mean, if we are real leftists, I, I think that uh, we don't, we don't, be, we don't have to be naive. The media has interest, clear interest in what they cover. And now they are trying to attack the government uh, showing this violence. But also the fem feminist movement are, what is, uh, what are they saying in the streets is that we need to stop it. And I think it's the, the time, the time is now under an administration that consider itself a leftist one, um, to stop them, to find the strategy to, to stop this kind of violence. Seven women a day in Mexico are being killed uh, by several reasons. So seven feminicides are occurring in this country. Uh, so it's, it's, this is like the whole picture. It's not about only a handless administration. It's a long story uh, about violence in, in Mexico. But I think that now this is allowing to talk about violence in, in this country. So there are so many indigenous movements who are against these policies of the government, but also the feminist movements. I think those two are the principal um, and the only, uh, I think, the real opposition uh, to this administration. So let me ask you about uh, the violence. There were, uh, the end of January, there were two environmentalists killed at the, um, at the Monarch Butterfly um, Reserve. And my understanding is that that was principally not over, um, not, not unfortunately over preserving butterflies, but it was uh, about um, illegal logging in the reserve. And so we see, and, and, and so can we talk a little bit about what's causing some of this illegal behavior that it's being, we see a lot of this illegal mining, logging, grabbing, a, you know, a di diverting of, of water sources, particularly in Honduras right now, we see transnational corporations grabbing these natural resources. Is this part of what's going on in Mexico as well? Yeah, actually, now that you're saying this, I'm just remembering these conversations that we usually have in Latin America about Greta Thunberg, about how easy it has been for her just to appear in several spaces as this a white a girl who is talking about climate change when our... Uh, human rights defenders, our environmental defenders are just being killed in our country, defending the water, defending um, and their spaces, they, their communities. And this is not something new, unfortunately, in Mexico. Mexico, for example, the levels of violence, this is the most dangerous country. And to be a journalist in Latin America. I mean, in the whole, in the whole continent. So it was it, it, like it, in a more personal than, level- More than Colombia, really, actually. Yeah, it's more dangerous it's, it's than Colombia. And I mean, and I mean, it's not also a coincidence that a coincidence is violence in Mexico and in Colombia when this, this is strategies of the U.S. fighting against uh, the narc traffic and things like that are going on. This is a strategy. It's a civil war against the communities uh, in order to get the, the corporations get all the benefits. That's the point. And in Mexico, it's something really, really sad. Anger. I mean, uh, what's going on is the level of uh, 
paramilitaries here in Mexico City, in Mexico in general, that it's also another thing that it's not on the corporate media. Um, they are the, the, the forest arm, like, they are the, the ones who are really operating for in, in benefit of the corporations. And they are the ones who are killing these people. It's not a uh, drug cartels uh, fight and struggle for territory. It's about money, it's about resources, it's about defending the 1% of the population and uh, is defending the strategies of the US, the, the United States here in Mexico, in Colombia, uh, in Honduras. Uh, that's the war in our countries. We are always talking about, for example, migration in our borders, but we don't say that it's because of a U.S. coup in our countries, like in Honduras in 2009, because they are uh, taking our resources, like in Mexico, Canada is taking our resources all the time, uh, our minerals, gold, uh, silver, everything. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a cycle all the time. This violence is not only about uh, the narco traffic, it's not about the paramilitaries, it's not about a fight between drug cartels, it's uh, a violence perpetrator over and over again by the U.S. imperialism, by the corporations in our countries. Uh, so that's how we can explain that the people who oppose to these uh, projects of terror, these projects of um, uh, spoiling our, our resources, uh, they are being killed. They are defending the water, defending our uh, environment, and defending uh, defending our territory it's a uh, good enough reason to to get killed in our countries so this level of violence involving environmentalists journalists women drug cartels um uh, transnational corporations i mean it's I mean, it's it's infiltrated all of society. And so can we take a few minutes? I know you were really, uh, you have a 1230 appointment. And so I'm so pleased you were able to join us today. And so I wanna <laughs> make sure we stick to our 20 minutes of hot news before I let you go. But um, <laughs> let's talk about how all of this is really, uh, this violence and, and the causes of it, the purposes leading to it, are root causes of migration, which many of us in the United States do not really understand um, in the in the detail that we we should why people flee yeah it's it's even like me i've been living in the u.s for the last three years of my life and i'm really privileged to have a visa passport and just doing what i do uh, actually now talking about journalism it was really hard for me to feel safer in the U.S., even when there is a lot of discrimination, harassment, even if I'm a, a Latina, a migrant. And I, I felt really privileged instead of being in Mexico reporting on the ground where, where it's really dangerous to do uh, our job every single day, more as a woman, as a, as a leftist reporter, I consider myself, who are showing all the time these kind of stories. So... It's really sad and I want to start by saying this because now that I experience all of this discrimination, harassment, or whatever in the US, now it's really sad for me to see that the Mexican government is doing exactly the same against Central Americans in my country. It's not something new. Uh, it's a policy that I understand that it's because of the pressures of the U.S., but there's not like a big solidarity movement with the people in Central America. Why are they fleeing? They're fleeing because of the coup and the destabilization of Honduras in 2009 against President uh, Manuel, uh, Manuel Celaya. Um, now, and it's proved that the... Uh, that the brother of the president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, was detained a year ago in Miami, and he's accused of uh, being part of drug cartels, narco traffic. Uh, I mean, it's a big mafia now in Honduras who are uh, in power, deciding what to do with the people uh, instead of uh, really looking for their like this for social justice. It's a drug. There are members of drug cartels in government and no one's saying that uh, because they are allies of the U.S. And 
the media, the corporate media, once again, uh, is trying to, to, to have a blackout, a total blackout, especially in, in Honduras, because the, the interest of the U.S. is like to be there uh, like physically or just to have an ally in Central America. Also in El Salvador, now it's really sad to see that the corporate media once again and the international community, whatever that means, because when it came about something in the US, everyone loses their mind, but when it's something about the rest of the world, the international community never appears. So uh, they're not talking about what's going on in El Salvador. In El Salvador, uh, after the war, the civil war in the 90, 1980s, um, they tried to to start a new democratic life that now are being destroyed. It's it's has been destroyed during the last less than a year with a new president, um, Nayib Bukele, who is a fascist, a total fascist. We saw two weeks ago militaries in the National Assembly. That it's something really hard for the people in us, especially in El Salvador, who had just a war, a civil war in the 80s. And he did exactly the same as the government in Honduras when it comes about Palestine, moving their embassy to Jerusalem. And they are cutting relationships with Venezuela. I mean, they are just another colonial state of the US in Central America. And of course, there, there are a lot of people looking for a, a better life. And also there's, there's still this idea that they're gonna find uh, this new life or a better, better conditions for living in the US because once again <laughs> of the corporate media that is spreading this idea the of the American dream. Yeah, it's the same. That's why I need to, that's why I well, insist in being journalist. Sometimes I'm really tired, but it's like, we need to do that. We need to, <laughs> we need to dismantle that lives. idea. Yeah. yeah it's and, important and for people mean, like me I'm, to come see you in Mexico and bring your stories back to the north. And it's important for you to come north and bring your story back to Mexico. You know, I will mention to our listeners um, last week, you mentioned El Salvador and um, uh, the military move at the National Assembly with the president. We did have a great conversation last Wednesday um, on our web webinar with Yesenia Portillo from um, CISPIS, who I'm sure you, you know, Alina, and she did a, a great talk on what actually happened um, in, in El Salvador. Yeah. And I think, you know, if there's one thing that you can briefly talk about before I need to let you go, is your, you know, all this, um, economic and political destabilization in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, south of the Mexico border. What is the Mexican government's role at the southern Mexico border that I would actually say has extended to be, you know, the de facto U.S. southern border? What is, the, is Mexico's vision and role now under President AMLO for the, I guess, uh, Mexico, Guatemala border, but yeah. it affects Hondurans and El Salvador, El Salvadorans as well. Yeah, yeah actually, that's a promise that President Donald Trump really, uh, he was, he was, uh, he's true when he said that Mexico was going to, to pay for the wall. It wasn't true at all, but Mexico now is the wall. And I must say it's, it's so sad that yeah, we are the wall, and that's absolutely true. And I understand, I must insist, that these kind of policies that AMLO's administration took during the last months, especially uh, during the last three months, uh, was because of the threats of President Trump that he, we know how Trump uh, rules everything, like threatening the rest of the world, and Mexico wasn't the exception. Uh, he uh, threatened us with uh, possible tariffs that obviously would affect our economy, so that's why the uh, AMLO's administration started this new uh, migrant uh, migration policy that we are seeing, but it's so sad because we are seeing exactly the same as uh, as I saw with my eyes one year ago when I was in the border um, of the, in the U.S. Uh, south border in Tijuana in Mexicali. Um, I was there and I was 
uh, seeing how desperate are thousands of families that are once again just looking for American dream, this false idea of American dream. And now we're seeing how Mexican government are doing exactly the same. They're the new CBP in, in, in Mexico. They are uh, uh, detaining migrants in centers that now human rights defender cannot get into those uh, centers of detention. And there are a lot of violations of human rights and the rhetoric is just making people in Mexico to be xenophobic. Now the same things that I listened to for the last three years of my life in the U.S. Uh, when it comes about migrants, that they are dangerous, that they're the invasion. And now people are repeating these uh, things here in Mexico uh, in order to support Mexican president. So that's why it's really important to speak from the left. I know that the right-wing opposition here in Mexico are have a really specific uh, uh, interest in attacking ambos administration, but that's true. It's true that there are a lot of violations of human rights, and I think the, it, this is only going to stop if the government get conscious of changing these narratives. That I must insist is the same narratives that the Republicans are using uh, for getting votes uh, with this white supremacist uh, population. So, what I can see is that there are just few senators, congressmen, who are really speaking out and saying that it's a uh, wrong strategy. And it's hard. Uh, I understand that there are a lot of pressures from the U.S., but they are not trying to, to create this movement of solidarity in, in the borders uh, to prioritize um, I mean, it's it's so hard for people to stay one day with their children in the border without eating, without having anything. Um, people are, and, and the government is just saying like, yeah, please wait. You need to wait. And it's like, no, it's not about wait. Uh, it's not about waiting. It's about they're, they're seeking for a better life. They don't have a, a food. They don't have anything. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to see that they are repeating exactly the same strategies that the U.S. administration um, are doing in, is doing in, in, in the border with Mexico. Well, I would just like to add in closing, because it's 1229 and I know I have to let you go. It's ironic and sad <laughs> to hear you saying this, because I remember in AMLO's um, inauguration speech that I guess, I believe that was January of 2019 or December of 18. Um, one of the things he said was that neoliberalism had completely failed in Mexico, and also, and and that is a, that that failure of neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism, is one of the root causes of migration, and not just from Mexico, but from much of the hemisphere. But um, he also mentioned creating an environment where migration was by choice rather than need. And it looks like uh, that we've got a long way to go before that's actually created, if ever. So. Yeah, actually, it's, it's really interesting, for example, that there is one of the congressmen actually in Morena, and he's from Morena, that he's saying that the strategy is really wrong. And it's, it's weird because he was part of the um, another administration. He's not uh, precisely the most leftist congressman in Morena, but he went to these uh, detention camps uh, to confirmate that the strategy is going bad that people who are seeking asylum in Mexico and or, or in the United States are, um, their human rights are getting violated. And it's, 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 it's really sad. So, and yeah, I, I have to say also that I do really believe that Mexico uh, is one of his, uh, like, he's a, um, it's part of these progressive governments that we saw during the, 2000s with Evo Morales, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. So what I'm trying to, to say is that we are late. We, we arrive late to these progressive governments, but we already saw the mistakes of these governments. And I don't think AMLO is aware that he needs to change a lot of the policies like extractivism and 
like migration policies. And so I think something something's going on during the last weeks here in Mexico that I've seen for the first time a lot of people who now are in the government saying this is not okay. We need to change and because it took 14 years to put AMLOs in uh, the presidential palace. So we are not going to let the right wing uh, opposition to uh, concentrate this indignation. So something is going on and I really hope that it changed for good, for the benefit of migrants, of people here in Mexico, and for the feminist movement uh, in the streets. So um, I'd really hope so. You know, Mexico could be the game changer for the entire hemisphere given its geographical size, its size and population. And, um, and I, th I think it's a really good uh, point you brought up that Mexico is late to the more progressive leftist governments, but perhaps um, the vanguard for it. Um, and we, you know, it and could, that's why it could be a potential game changer. Yeah, and that's why it's really important to understand that the U.S. can do whatever they want in any moment. They're not going to let Mexican government to do whatever they want and to start another progressive uh, government in the region to do as, as Hugo Chavez did. It started new organizations, regional organizations, to change the idea that another world is possible. So that's why we need to be aware of all of the intentions of the U.S. in, in, in Mexico. I think they are still, they are now operating, that there are a lot of possibilities of a coup in any moment they have in their favor, um, the paramilitaries, the drug cartels. I mean, they don't need to arm the opposition. They don't need to put people in the streets as, as they did in uh, Libya, in Venezuela, uh, the, in Nicaragua. They just can't arm, they, they can't just pay all the drug cartels who are operating in the whole country to start uh, this civilization movement in, in this region. So yeah, let's see, let's see what happens. I understand that the Mexican government has a lot of pressure from the US. It's not easy being neighbor for, <laughs> of the empire. <laughs> Definitely it is not. Uh, we have a, a very uh, famous uh, phrase here in Mexico that we, that we are really far from God, but really near to the US. So it's something like it really explains that it's not that easy for Andres Manuel just to go to become anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist with all of the dependence that has uh, structurally from the U.S. So let's see what happens. I must insist. I'm really hopeful that something can can happen for the next month, especially when a lot of people inside the government now are speaking out and saying we to, to do this better or the right wing opposition can take advantage of it. Well, that is actually encouraging news. And so with that, I'm going to let you go because I, I know I promised you I'd have you off here at 12. <laughs> <laughs> so I've yeah, I'm I'm made you late for your appointment, I'm but I'm, I'm so happy to share this half hour with you, Alina. Just so our <laughs> viewers know, she, Alina has been a neighbor and good friend of mine um, since moving here to DC. And I so value your knowledge, your experience and your friendship. And I look forward to you coming back on our program. Perfect. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, well, yeah, in three weeks, I'm going to I'm going to be speaking actually about migration in Maryland and, and the International Day of Women. So I'm going to I'm going to post it on my social networks. Alina Duarte, you can find me everywhere in Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. And so, yeah, we'll I, I would love to see all of you. Perfect, Terry. Okay. Thanks right. for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. And the rest of you can join us next week, Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern for What the F is Going On in Latin America. And don't forget, tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, you can join us on um, Code Pink Radio, WPFW, Washington, D.C., WBAI, New York City. Okay, everyone, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye bye.